Okay, so good afternoon, or should I say, yes, early afternoon to you guys. Um, welcome to Webinar Wednesday, our first edition for uh, May 2020. Um, we're coming to you from our homes this morning, um, or this afternoon, I should say, wherever you are. So welcome to our attendees from Jamaica, St. Lucia, Guyana. We have persons as far as Scotland joining the um, webinar this morning. So welcome to you all. I hope everybody is safe. And um, we're, before we get started, we just want to um, just go through a, some quick, um, what should I say, uh, webinar etiquettes where make sure that your cameras um, have been turned off, your mic is muted. Um, if you have any questions for us, please feel free to uh, post it on the Q&A chat box. If you want to share comments and engage um, the participants on the webinar this afternoon, also, you know, there's a chat box option as well for you to um, use. So just be mindful of those. Questions and answers will be taken at the end. Hopefully we can get in a good 10 to 15 minutes of questions. And of course, at the end, we wanna hear from you. There's a webinar, uh, SurveyMonkey uh, evaluation form that will be sent to you, but at the, on your screen, you will be seeing the SurveyMonkey link for, for us to hear from you. Give us an idea of you know, how useful you found the topic has been as well as what would you be looking forward to us bringing to you um, through the Webinar Wednesday uh, platform. So today we are going to talk about performance management. It's a big topic. It's a very topical one. We're all facing uncharted territory and learning as we go, I would say. And this means that many organizations are currently reassessing their feedback strategy. Over the last few weeks, we've heard of organizations deciding to either abandon their current or upcoming performance cycle, uh, or they've been giving persons the same rating or deciding if to give persons the same ratings, or even if, you know, just to continue as job uh, with their job evaluations as planned. But many HR leaders are still unsure about how to manage performance reviews during COVID-19. Today, we hope to provide some options, some perspectives, and things to consider before you close out your current or begin your next performance cycle. Should you keep running performance evaluations during COVID, uh, this COVID pandemic? When deciding what to do during this time of crisis, consider these questions. Whether you will continue performance evaluations or abbreviate your approach for the time being. Um, perhaps these questions may guide you. Is your performance review process fairly established? So for instance, have you been conducted or have you conducted at least two performance cycles so far? Is a large part of your employee population still working? Does your performance um, reviews, are they tied into your bonus payments? In terms of workforce continuity, is your organization running close to business as usual? These, are, these may be some options to consider and you might be able to either continue or um, your, your performance evaluation as planned or have some form of evaluation. To help us bring some insights and, and share his perspective today, I'm very happy to welcome um, Dr. Marlon Sukal. He's coming to us from the Chicago School of Professional Psychology as an associate professor. Um, he would be chatting with us um, based on his areas of interest and experience in terms of work-life balance, 
uh, talking about diversity and inclusion, telecommunicating uh, work arrangements, virtual team dynamics, uh, culture fit, and so on. He's bringing to us a lot of uh, experience in terms of organizational and behavioral competencies. So I want to uh, welcome uh, Marlon as we um, have fondly been calling him. Um, Marlon has been working with the school um, through the Leadership Institute, our executive education area and so on, um, to bring to us, you know, some of the perspectives from his school of uh, professional uh, psychology in Chicago. And today we hope to you know, continue that conversation with him. Um, and I want to bring on Marlon now, as I stop sharing my screen, uh, to continue the conversation. And I will come back to you as we move into question and answers at the end. Well, thank you, Sasha. I'll uh, upload my slides here. Just give me one second. Sure. Okay, let me know when you can when you can see that. Is that projecting? Yeah, you are projecting. Oh, very good. Excellent. Well, thank you, Sasha, for the, for the uh, warm introduction. Uh, happy to be a part of Webinar Wednesday and allowing them to share my expertise in regards to performance management. It really is an important topic and a, and a timely one especially during a pandemic where Sasha nicely framed what we're going to talk about today. Is it relevant currently and how you can make the adjustments for uh, your performance management cycle? So here are some basic learning objectives. Uh, we have, we're, we're going to try and cram in a lot during this time, but it, it really is food for thought and as well as giving you suggestions on what we can do in our various industries as we think about performance management. So really quickly, I want to def define performance management, talk about how do we appraise our current performance management system in our organization, think about a contingency plan for the immediate future. And, and when I say a continu contingency plan for the immediate future, really thinking about what is to be done, at least in the last quarter or quarter four for most organizations and how it may impact longer term goals. I also want to talk about how you communicate with your employees and give some suggestions there in terms of performance expectations. We'll talk also about training managers and how to adjust their performance management protocol and then evaluate some of the short term and long term solutions. So, so quite a bit to go through. And so let's just jump right into it. So first off, performance management, what does that mean? So I took this uh, quote or this definition from Herman Aguinas. He actually, uh, I actually teach with him in his department. He is a part of the George Washington University and he has written several textbooks on performance management. So he really is a subject matter expert when it comes to performance management. And he defines it as a continuous process of identifying, measuring, developing the performance of individuals and teams, aligning performance with the strategic goals of the organization. And you notice he mentioned how we align this with strategic goals. And generally that's how performance management is defined. It's really looking at our overall goals based on our organization's strategic plan and then how do we tie individual goals to that strategic plan? So ideally, most performance management systems are goals-based. From a complexity standpoint though, and I've seen different types of performance management systems and protocols, it is goals-based, but you could also include skills, competencies, values, and behaviors, all part of your performance management system. So, for the most part, we, the default would be the goals, but there are also other aspects to performance management. So that's a general definition. Uh, by the way, if there are any questions, I wanna make sure that um, those are being answered. So Namali, if, if there are any questions that are or needs to be answered, feel free to jump in and let me know what those questions are. Certainly. Okay, so I wanna do a quick poll here and I'll turn it over to Namala to help with the poll. But I want you to think about 
from a performance management standpoint, is it relevant to your organization? So Normala, do you want to start the start the poll? Right. So on here, you'll see uh, the chance to give your give your input in regards to performance management. Is it relevant to your current organization? Yes, it's relevant, and we use it. No, it's not relevant. It's not being used well. You're not sure, or my company does not use any sort of performance management system or protocol or yearly performance management cycle. So please feel free to vote. We'll give about uh, 40 minutes, 40 seconds or so to, to vote on that. Okay, so the the outcome is 93% said performance management is relative to your organization. 1% uh, said no, zero said not sure, and 6% said my company does not do any sort of performance management. So that's actually a really good sign. It, the, the good sign there is that some sort of performance management is relevant to your organization. So clearly organizations understand the aspect of performance management and how important that is. So that's good to hear. So let's build upon that then. So thank you for doing that poll. Okay, so I managed to get some uh, reading material in regards to a survey done by HRC Associates and they essentially surveyed 148 organization CEOs and executives across Trinidad and Tobago industries. And this was a recent survey around the impact of COVID-19. And here were their findings. 83% experienced decreased demand for services, right? So we would expect that knowing that we're going through a pandemic and many organizations are closed or cannot sustain uh, their businesses. 76% decrease in projected 2020 revenue. 91% implementing cost containment measures and 90% reviewing HR strategies. So all astonishing statistics. And that's also true with the United States, probably, probably worse. But here's the direct link to performance management. 90% reviewing HR strategy, that's the direct link to performance management. So really organizations are thinking about how do they review HR strategy and consequently how performance would be impacted from that standpoint. So one of the major companies out here in the States is McKinsey and Company, and you've probably heard of McKinsey and Company. They're one of the major international consulting firms based in the United States. And they are experts in regards to performance management and they publish a lot of material on performance management and they're following this COVID very carefully and working with organizations to help with general HR strategy. So here's what they say in regards to performance management. First of all, it's effective performance management is essential to businesses. It is one of the core aspects of a business and it's good to see that 93% of you said that. Organizations that get performance management right become formidable competitive machines. In other words, if you outline your performance management system well, it would help you in terms of your sustainability in your competitiveness in the market. Strong performance management rests on the simple principle that what gets done gets measured or what gets measured gets done. And that's important because it is about tracking metrics, right? And so you, in terms of your performance management system should have some sort of way to track data and track metrics. And we'll talk about that in a second. But here's the catch here. Too many companies, the performance management system is slow, wobbly, or downright broken. And so that's important to note that although we do have performance management 
aspects in place, it's not being done properly or it's broken or something is wrong with it. And to exacerbate the situation, now we're in the middle of a pandemic and that's what's troubling here is how would that impact our current performance management? So that's what we're essentially going to talk about and get into. So let's talk about your current PM. What does that look like? And have you appraised it recently? Again, thinking about organizations, at least here in the States, now is an opportune time to really look at your performance management system, especially since many companies, at least in the States, are uh, ending their, their cycle or their fiscal year. And in Q4, this is when they generally do their final performance management check-ins with employees. So now would be uh, the appropriate time to really talk about this and uh, consequently how you would adjust your performance management cycle. So what does your current cycle look like? So I, I gave a quick chart that I pulled from the internet here on what performance management essentially looks like from a very broad perspective. So starting with that uh, chart on the right and up top, you'll see determining performance expectations. So your performance management is based around performance expectations. And we'll talk about some of those performance expectations with your employees and how that may have changed. So that's the first part. Second is supporting performance. So how do you support your employees for their performance? Do you train them well? Do you hire correctly? Do you uh, gauge their competencies, their skills, their behavior? All of these things tie into performance. Then the performance cycle starts. How do you review how they're doing? How do you appraise their performance? And that's the performance management piece of it. How do you gauge that through some sort of data? And then consequently, that, that fourth box there, how do you review any sort of performance expectations? In other words, are they doing what they need to do? Are they hitting their targets? And how are you adjusting accordingly? Are you training them more? Are you taking away work from them, et cetera? So this essentially is your performance management cycle in a nutshell. Some additional things to consider. We talked about this earlier, goals, competencies, values, behaviors, and our skills. What does your current performance management system look like? Do you have it just as goals-based or do you have a combination of all of these? And I've seen ones where they're really simple. There's the primarily goals-based and I've seen others that are much more complex and they have all of these associated with their performance management. Also think about how frequently this is done. And this generally is based on the industry. So for instance, IT firms, uh, the big IT firms like Google and Intuit and uh, Facebook, they do these on a monthly basis. That's how often they do performance cycles. Um, sales, they tend to do those on a quarterly basis. They look at Q1, Q2 through Q4. And more the traditional uh, institutions such as universities, they tend to do this on a semi-annual or yearly basis. So it really depends on the industry and the organization. Also thinking about the type of data used in performance management, it could be quantitative, meaning some sort of rating where there are anchors associated with it. The simplest ones I've seen is met or not met, or a three-point rating where they've exceeded standard or exceeded their gold, or it is met or not met, um, in which case you would have to do some sort of performance improvement plan with that employee. In addition to that, you may have qualitative data. In other words, they do a self rating and they have to give qualitative comments on the progress of their goals, along with the quantitative, which could be a mixed data capture, or you may have um, reviews that are simply qualitative. For instance, faculty. Um, I know of institutions that primarily just do qualitative ratings and, and have basically abandoned the quantitative ratings. So that's also something to think about or appraise in your current performance management. Also think about how it is done. So generally there's some sort of self-rating where the employee rate themselves and they write comments about themselves on how they're doing. The manager also does a rating, either blind or not blind, meaning that they've rated the employee separately from looking at the self ratings, or they've looked at the self ratings of the employee and then have added on to their ratings. And then there's some sort of next level approver, meaning the director or vice president or some sort of executive would look at all the ratings all together and do some sort of calibration around the fairness of the ratings. 
And then Sasha alluded to this, thinking about how it is linked to merit and bonus and or recognition. I've worked for companies where it is not linked and is entirely separate and other companies where it is absolutely linked and you get um, not just merit, but also bonus, such as sales as, as an example. Sales link merit and bonus directly to performance outcomes and other organizations may just have cost of living and do not want to li uh, a link performance management to any sort of merit or bonus. Okay, so I know that was a lot to take in there uh, in regards to thinking about a contingency plan now. So you've evaluated your current performance appraisal. You know what it's like. You probably have been a part of developing your current performance management program. So what would that look like in the face of a pandemic, right? And some factors to consider on how you adjust accordingly. So here's the reality. The reality is COVID-19 has stalled company progress and that's across the world. Uh, that's across, and that's putting it mildly, that's across the world. And because of that, companies need to reinvent themselves and they will need to continue to reinvent themselves. So that's uh, an important initial consideration. Secondly, employees are not able to complete the yearly goals. They're just not. It is a fact of, uh, because of this pandemic, the Q Q4 goals, whatever the Q4 goals were, is not going to be able to be achieved for the most part. Budgeting is also another big issue. Companies are bleeding any sort of profit. They're bleeding funds and some are even going under. But let's talk about those that are, have sustained themselves so far. They will have to repurpose their budget. And so because of that, certain goals that uh, needed budget to be completed may not be a priority anymore. And then fourth, goals may be canceled and postponed because of this, so we have to keep that into consideration. So that's one part of it. The second part is now the way we do work has changed. So for instance, organizations and industries that can sustain their business by allowing their employees to work from home they need to adjust to a new move, moving target. And that would be adjusting to new performance outcomes based on working from home, which is a much different dynamic than working in the office. And on top of that, they have to continue to stay agile in terms of business continuity, continuity through high levels of performance and engagement and some of the other things that we talk about while we're in the office, it now has to be transferred to, to home life. And so let's dig into that a little bit more. So in terms of those changes in performance, I've done some research in regards to what organizations, at least in the US, are doing. And I've, I've saw, I saw quite a few um, in various industries. And I put together a list on what they are doing. And, and many of this is actually pulled from Harvard Business. And so I wanted to share what they are doing in terms of a contingency plan. And, and when I say for the immediate future, generally I'm looking at within the next three months or so where most American companies are doing their performance management ending cycle. Usually it's in Q4. So the first option here, no performance management during the cycle. You abolish performance management entirely knowing that you're not going to be able to hit your goals this year. So that's one option. Another, postpone performance management until employees can achieve their goals, assuming they could do it in the next three months or so. Assuming you have business continuity and assuming that your employees will continue to perform at a high level to be able to do that. So you may decide to postpone your performance management cycle and push the dates back, if you will. Another option would be just qualitative comments, so abandoning ratings altogether. So let's think about this for a second. If you have a high performing employee and they're used to getting high marks, high ratings, always exceeding standard, and this year they cannot hit their goals because of COVID, and you go ahead and you say, you do not meet standard because of COVID, what does that mean? What does that do for them, right? So that makes them demotivated uh, and all these other psychological issues that come about any sort of failure in their jobs right? They would also probably worry about getting laid off and, and all these other things that would come up. So what I'm seeing companies do is they abandon the ratings altogether and just have qualitative comments. In other words, overall, how were they doing within at least nine months of the year, keeping in mind COVID happened and it just derailed everything. Also being flexible on not achieving goals. 
in other words, you know, many of our goals are not going to be achieved during the year. And how flexible are you in, in being a bit more forgiving in terms of your ratings as a manager? And then the last one I have there, allow employees to adjust their goals based on COVID-19. So having uh, general language such as this, I give an example, please outline accomplishments based on your annual goals where appropriate note any challenges with achieving your goals due to the impact of COVID-19. So this ties back into forgiveness in terms of the impact of COVID-19 and how they could adjust their goals accordingly. In other words, if they are set to not make goals, can they readjust those goals in the performance management system that would allow them at that point a favorable rating? So that's, those, those, again, these are some examples that are provided. Okay, so let's transition to, and again, uh, if there are any questions coming in, please feel free to, uh, to put those in the chat. I know I'm going over quite a bit of information here. So let's transition into performance expectations for employees and how do we as leaders communicate these performance expectations knowing that the way we work has changed at least for the unforeseeable future, right? So working from home is a much different dynamic than working in the office. You don't have those clear boundaries of home and office and everything is blurred at this point. It's ironic, this was actually part of my dissertation is to look at some of the aspects in regards to working from home versus working in an office. So the very first thing is technology. Technology has changed. You have to make the adjustments for your employee in terms of access to technology, access to a laptop or computer if they did not have that, and all the technology associated with that, which would include software and platforms, even a, a cell phone if they did not have one. Whatever the case, they need to increase, you, you have to make accommodations for the increase in use of technology. Secondly, check-ins, communication. Communication is critical, especially with employees working from home. Ask, as simple things as asking how they're doing or having regular check-ins with them to see how things are trending as they're working from home. Thinking about work times and scheduling, right? So a nine to five schedule may not be appropriate working from home. Thinking about loved ones, thinking about family, thinking about them disturbing you during their regular work day, thinking about when they get up in the morning versus when they uh, go to bed, thinking about their schoolwork, you know, all of these things impact work times and schedules. And so being a little bit flexible in that regard, again, setting these performance expectations, whatever your organization has decided upon, that needs to be considered. Improving family balance. This is a, this is a hard one, uh, mainly because you don't have those clear boundaries working from home, right? You have family disturbing your work and you have work disturbing your family. And so those, those, those lines, those boundaries are crossed all the time on a daily basis, uh, usually. And that could actually create quite a bit of stress for the, for your employee. Here's another big one. Establish trust. If you didn't have trust with your employee when you were in person, it's going to be even more imperative that you establish trust when you're working remotely. Trust is a huge factor in regards to managing your and leading your employees. And so again, that's where those check-ins come in to, to be able to try or at least try to establish that trust with your employees. Here's another one, stress, anxiety, burnout. They're actually doing quite a bit of studies here in the States in regards to stress and anxiety and burnout, especially during the COVID pandemic. And they're showing obviously increased signs of stress and anxiety. And burnout has been studied quite a bit in, in research. Um, as Again, as part of my research, I was able to show that burnout is actually a consequence of working from home. We tend to actually work more hours at home. We tend to work different hours at home. We tend to work um, much differently than we would in the office. And again, those, those boundaries, those lines, including your use of time is crossed. And so because of that, because of the extra time that you, that you work, you, you actually sustain more of a burnout issue. So also keep that in mind. Also, again, tying in with uh, calendars and planners, um, if employees do not know how to plan their day out, it's going to be even more difficult for them. So having blocks of work time as part of their calendar and, and planning their time accordingly is important. 
Um, also encouraging breaks, again, this ties in with burnout and, and trying to minimize that. So ensuring that they, they take lunch breaks as an example. I, I find when I work from home, I tend to skip lunch. And so we don't think about that or, how, or realize how quickly the day goes by. Also think about hobbies, you know, being, being locked up and, and not being able to uh, get out as much as we usually get out. Um, we have to think about how do we have a safe hobby where we could keep our health intact while at the same time perhaps getting some exercise and that sort of thing. And then also thinking about recognition, we tend to recognize our employees really easily um, in person, but what about um, when they're working remotely? Do we recognize them the same way? And then, of course, feedback, um, getting that feedback from them, make sure we do some sort of survey to see how they're doing, do uh, part of the check-ins, get feedback. That's how we can become better as leaders and managers, right? It's when we get that feedback from our employees. So this is just a list. It's not an exclusive list, but this is a pretty decent list of various things you need to think about when tweaking your performance expectations for your employees in a remote environment. And this may or may not change in the immediate future. There are plans to reopen the country. There are plans to do it in a phased approach. But in some cases, you may decide, you know, based on the safety of your employees, you may want to push that thing, push, push working uh, in person back a bit. Um, I know in some places in the United States, um, for instance, education in California, they have actually shut down universities or at least doing online teaching for the rest of the calendar year. So again, thinking about your, your particular industry and your company and what you decide to do for the immediate future, but these are some performance expectations you'd wanna consider. Okay, so the next phase, once you've identified performance expectations is really thinking about how you tie that into your new performance management protocol and then there needs to be training around it for your managers. You have to equip your managers to be able to not only um, have these performance expectations, but also how do, you, how do you measure it, right? So how do you put it as part of your performance management platform? Many of you will have some sort of platform to be able to do performance management, whether it's Cornerstone or PeopleSoft or SuccessFactors, whatever platform you use, that needs to be adjusted. All right, so we talked about regular check-ins, we talked about technology. Once you've updated your performance management system with the new performance management changes, mm -hmm. you will have to then think about your ratings, whether you're using ratings or not, is it done fairly? Also, how are you doing comments? Do you need to give some more guidance around how to do qualitative comments in the performance management system? And you also have to think about, uh, you know, who's going to evaluate those higher levels of performance management ap approvals. So, so there has to be a training regimen around or help it to be able to help you managers. And many organizations are going through this once they've made the adjustment to your performance management protocol. And, and like 93% said earlier, that you already have a performance management system, so most likely you will have some sort of training. It's just a matter of tweaking that manager training so it it is appropriate for, for whatever you decide would be the appropriate changes. And then of course, the last bullet point on here would be maintain your performance management data for future use, right? And that leads me into an organizational case scenario. And so I, wanna make, I wanted to make this uh, a bit interactive in regards to an actual real world organizational case scenario that I'm actually working, working with so here it is. An organization's yearly review cycle starts June 15th with uh, assessments, self-assessments, followed by manager review and then final VP approval. So that's their general uh, performance management cycle. The caveat is the organization is also projected to lose 100 to 300 million through the calendar year because of COVID. 10 to 25% of employees inevitably will be laid off or fired. So that's, that's the general scenario. So here are the questions. Should managers use the upcoming PM process to help inform employees retain or fired? And is this a good use of the performance management process? Any alternatives? 
So this, this may seem like obvious questions, but it's actually not if you really think about this. And I, and I don't want to prime it too much. I, I, I really want us to take maybe a, a couple minutes to jot down your responses to each of these questions. And then I then want to open it up and share what you, what you came up with. So I'll allow a couple of minutes to do this on your own and then we'll share with each other. And Namala, if you could monitor the chat, if anyone wants to put their responses in there, that would be yeah. great. So there are about three questions, four questions posed already. I sent it to you on the, the private message. You may want to look at them. Okay, and great. Chat. Yeah, great. All right, good questions in here. I see them. So I'll answer those once we complete this quick exercise. All right, so as you've given this some thought, feel free to put those in the chat or if you have availability to your, to your microphone, feel free to jump in and say what you think in regards to those two questions. It looks like mics have been disabled, so feel free to chat uh, or copy and paste whatever you wrote into the into the chat box. Ramallah, any responses coming in from your end? Okay, so let's uh, let's give this some more thought. I do. Um, have a hard stop. So I want to make sure that we get to some of the questions. So I just want to move on to the to the last slide, which is basically sort of wrapping things up in regards to what we discussed in terms of short term solutions and really thinking about what the longer term solutions would be. So here's what we talked about so far. Uh, evaluate PM solutions based on the unforeseeable future, right? So thinking about this from a short-term and long-term perspective. So first, the short-term solutions. As I mentioned, revise your PM system based on your appraisal of what it currently looks like and what would be the limitations associated with your current PM system and how you can change things due to COVID-19. And I've given some suggestions there in regards to language, et cetera. Also think about how you communicate these new expectations to employees and consequently how you train managers. So those are two important aspects that we also talked about. Also thinking about how you link merit and bonuses to performance management based on budget. You may not have a budget and you may have to abolish your merit process altogether, which is a, a separate and a side issue, but it is, a, it is an important one to consider. 
So those are the general short-term solutions. And then you have longer term solutions. And this is where the help of a consultant would help in, in this regard. So first of all, you have to think about business continuity based on whatever the new normal is. And it would be based on the industry. Some industries are able to do or continue their business virtually. Others cannot. Um, manufacturing is severely affected. The hospitality industry, the tourism industry, um, those are all af are affected uh, tremendously. So for instance, the, the, uh, the tour tourism industry here in the United States, 40% of employees are laid off uh, because you can't continue that sort of, there's no new normal to that, right? Um, other industries are flourishing. The IT industry, they're doing quite well. They have actually improved their stocks. Um, so again, it depends on how you can continue businesses. One, one really good example is Twitter. Twitter allowed all of their employees to continue working indefinitely remotely going forward. So they basically changed their business altogether. Uh, second bullet point there, reevaluate job function and behavioral competencies for a remote workforce. As I mentioned, your workforce is going to change and the expectations and behavioral competencies will change based on whatever the new normal is. So if there's some sort of blended approach to work, whether uh, in person, remotely, or a combination thereof, you have to think about what those competencies would look like. Ensure permanent wellness solutions to enable satisfied and engaged employees. That's also important because you have to think about their general wellness as they continue to work in this sort of environment. That would be critically important. And then the last is how do you rebrand your business model? What are the consequence services, products that is tied to performance outcomes? That is so critical. And this is where strategic planning for the next three to five years would really impact your business. And this is where you make use of a consultant to help in this regard. Because your services products will change, it may, uh, it may be obsolete, or you may be, decide to offer new products and services depending on what the new business model would be like. So this is why you need to incorporate the help of uh, consulting folks to help with new business planning, new outcomes, and a new way to do work. So this is where your entire performance management will change. So here I've offered both long-term and short-term solutions. So with that, I, I want to go back to some of the, uh, some of the questions I saw and, and address those. So um, I'll, I'll quickly jump into what those questions will look like. Uh, one question came in, where forms are already created and have quantitative fields, how do you treat, uh, treat with this? It sounds like there are some uh, questions around how do you operate with quantitative fields, and we talked about that, so I'm not sure if I need to address that again. You may decide to abolish your quantitative fields and just do qu uh, qualitative, or you may abolish um, your performance management system altogether. Uh, there's another question, how important and useful do you think it would be to guide employees to identify other areas of work development to be done during the periods away from the office? This is, and this ties in with new performance expectations. So it would be absolutely necessary to do that. If you are uh, able to work with your employee, uh, again, establishing new performance goals while they're working from home is a short-term solution. And then the longer-term solution is how would that look on a permanent basis if you decide to change your business model, right? Or you may decide to change it temporarily based on the new way of work and then switch back to the old way of work. Again, that would, that would depend on your business. Uh, in some organizations, we have some employees working over and above their regular duties and hours while others due to technology constraints doing absolutely nothing but all are receiving their full salaries. If in fact the performance management is postponed for COVID-19 cycle in such an organization, how do you highlight reward those hardworking employees outside of the performance assessment? This is a very good question. And this is where changes in your performance management expectations come into play is really establishing what your performance management looks like. And it's usually based around some sort of deliverable, some sort of goal that each employee needs to have, right? So if you have employees that are doing really well and they're performing, meaning they're, they have the deliverables associated with your performance um, service or product, and they're delivering that, you know that they're delivering. On the other hand, if you have employees that are not producing what they need to do, 
whether completing a project or communicating in a timely manner, those sorts of things needs to be closely monitored. So that way you could differentiate who are your high performing individuals versus not. So it does require a little bit more micromanaging, if you will, for working remotely to be able to really monitor what they're doing because quite frankly, you can't see them, but you can check in with them and, and technology also helps. You could actually see when someone has checked in to uh, Microsoft Teams as an example, or you could see if someone is uh, coming to meetings on time, you know, all of those things in terms of performance management will help. And also I talked about the importance of uh, setting those expectations up front. So that's a really good question. Another question, how do you deal with employees or employers who do not pay attention to feedback? Uh, it would behoove the employee in the employer, excuse me, not to pay attention to feedback. And feedback from your employees are so important and you have to pay attention to the feedback. And if they're not, they're losing valuable information. As we say here, feedback is a gift. And if we don't take it seriously, then we're gonna lose information. So I'm, I'm not sure how to answer that. All I can say to that is you have to adhere to some sort of feedback from your employees. In fact, you should set up some sort of feedback mechanism to do that. Various organizations are sending out surveys on how are we doing during this COVID-19 pandemic, quite simply as that, and being able to get feedback from their employees. Another question, how can you encourage managers to complete outstanding performance evaluations during this time while preparing them for the new changes to the system? So again, this goes back to the entire presentation really is making sure that we train managers. That's the key. We have to establish what the new performance expectations are and training them accordingly. And so again, going through these slides, which would be available to you, um, it, it outlines those steps to be able to do that. So uh, with that, Sasha, um, I do have a, a hard one o'clock um, stoppage time. And uh, I certainly wanna thank you for the opportunity to present today. And I will turn it back over to you. Okay, thank you, Malon. So we have a lot of questions coming in. So perhaps um, I know time is, is limited. So maybe there may be some opportunity for us to um, join in again and continue the discussions and conversations. Um, one of the things just to add, Marlon, trust and communication as we go through this whole performance management and trying to figure out what works best and who's productive and who's not productive and who should be doing what. Um, fundamentally, um, I liked your comment, if, if trust wasn't there or communication wasn't there before, it's gonna be an uphill battle working um, remotely uh, and that relationship with the employee and employer becomes um, further constrained, I suppose. Um, so something to think about guys. Um, we would have indicated, uh, Malin, if you wanna stop sharing your screen so I can share mine. Sure, and thanks again. All right, so um, as we, Great. All right. So for for you guys who you know would not have been able to um, get your answers to those uh, questions you posed us, we will definitely be uh, liaising with Marlon later on and getting back to you. So as we wrap up our webinar for today, I want to share with you a couple um, upcoming events. Uh, I want you to know that the Lockjack GSB is open for business. Our academic programs for September 2020 have been listed on your screen. We have our undergraduate program as well as our international MBA and executive MBA, along with our port, trade and logistics programs being offered. Um, so continue to send in those applications and there's an email address we can send to you after as well for further information or of course check our website. Uh, to introduce you to our webinar for next week. 
we are kicking off our uh, certification program for the WAVE psychometric uh, questionnaire that's happening at the end of the month. And we have with us next week, Wednesday, the facilitator for that program, Ms. Jackie Archer, coming to us from Seville Consulting. Um, so join us then. It sets us up nicely for that certification program at the end of the month. So now is the time to gain your certification in one of the industry leading assessment tools. The registration information would be posted on the chat for you. Also coming up, we've had an overwhelming uh, demand for a balanced scorecard program. We actually have that program running now in the month of May to be wrapping up uh, at the end of this week. Because of demand for it, we've added a third program in June. So also learn how to plan and execute using highly integrative approaches that can get your organization results um, using the balanced scorecard. And that's happening in June, so you can find out more. And of course, our executive education programs continue to um, be offered. We've seamlessly moved into an online platform and you would see listed on your screen. It's quite a lot that we have happening from now until the end of the year. Um, so feel free to contact us to find out about our executive education programs or professional certification programs. And of course, any one of these programs can be delivered to your organizations um, based on the numbers of, of persons who may want to, to become um, proficient in any one of these areas. So as I wrap up our webinar for this afternoon, uh, remember um, if you need training, and consulting support, please contact us. And of course, any ideas or topics that you would like to have us discuss on the webinar Wednesday platform, please feel free to reach out to us. And you can do so by completing our webinar survey. The link is posted. And of course, at the end of this as well, we would send it to you via email. So have a great afternoon everybody keep safe and of course um look out for today's recording on our youtube channel the link would have been sent to you in the email um that would have been sent previously to invite you to the zoom um webinar this afternoon so look out for us on your youtube channel as well so thank you all very much and we look forward to your uh, participation in our upcoming webinars. Hey, Sash, great stuff. Bye-bye. Bye, participants. <laughs>